Hey everyone, as promised, this is going to be a video about collecting mushrooms. So I had attached a link to mushroomexpert.com um, describing how to collect mushrooms. And this is going to be an overview of that article plus a little tidbits I have gleaned from my own experience. So to start with mushrooms, um, first thing is that you can't hurt yourself by touching any mushrooms. So a lot of people are concerned with mushrooms because we don't know what they are, we don't know what they can do, and they want to know, you know, if I touch them, can I hurt myself? You're not going to hurt yourself by touching them. The only way to hurt yourself with mushrooms is to eat them um, and also to eat enough quantity of a poisonous mushroom to have the uh, impact of whatever that toxin in that mushroom will yield. So long story short, you can't hurt yourself by touching any mushrooms. So as you're out foraging, don't be afraid to touch mushrooms, pick them up, take a good look at them. When we're out foraging for mushrooms, you want to bring a couple of pieces of equipment. One of the first ones is a knife. Um, a knife is really helpful because often when you, if you're collecting for foraging, you might want to just cut the mushroom straight off of its stalk and not pull it up because if you pull it up, there could be dirt that could be on the base that could get on the rest of your mushrooms and could kind of contaminate your collection. And then you'd be eating gritty mushrooms, which is never a pleasant experience. Another thing you want to make sure that you have is a way to carry and separate your mushrooms. So one of the best things to do is to have a bunch of um, waxed bags. And these, these will allow you to put your individual specimens in individual compartments. Um, you don't want to use plastic bags because plastic bags will keep all of the moisture from the mushrooms in that one little enclosed container and the mushrooms can kind of sweat and they will then become slimy and gross and you wouldn't really want to handle them or uh, eat them after that because they become much less uh, appealing. Because even after you pick the mushrooms, they are still respiring, they're still, you know, essentially exhaling uh, CO2 and water um, so they can create a very different climate in an enclosed space. Uh, paper bags also work. Um, I wouldn't want to keep them in a paper bag as long as something else because they can, you know, make the paper bag wet. They could eventually break through it. Not the best thing. I personally, for shorter trips, will use a tackle box. Tackle box, you can also have the issue of making mushrooms sweat. They're not held very stable, so they can knock against the walls. That can break the cell walls and make them more wet as well. But um, for small, small journeys, a tackle box works. If you are out hiking and you see a mushroom and you don't know what it is and you also don't have any means of collecting it, you can take pictures. We all have, not we all, um, many of us have smartphones. So if you have a camera on you or a smartphone, you can take a picture of the top of the mushroom, the top of the cap, the underside, the stalks or the, or sorry, the gills or the little um, teeth, icicle hanging things or the sp uh, pores, little holes that appear in the bottom of some mushrooms. Um, you want to also take a picture of the stalk, uh, get a nice, um, well-focused picture of that, the base of the stalk, and then the substrate that it's growing on. So you want to look at, is it growing on dead wood? Is it growing on live wood? Is it growing on leaf litter? Um, is it coming out of the ground? What's it growing on? Sometimes to figure out the substrate, you have to dig a little bit. There are some mushrooms that will grow on dead wood that's buried, like roots, or uh, classic examples, cordyceps as well. They uh, grow on insects that are often underground. So you'll see a little finger poking up and on the bottom of that finger will be a pupa of some sort of thing or a, a, a grub or something like that with the mushroom growing out of it. So looks can be a little bit deceiving. Sometimes it requires a little bit of digging to figure out what the substrate is. Um, in terms of noting what it's growing on, this can help you decide between uh, one species of mushroom or another. Uh, one of the basic ones, if it's growing on a tree, it, uh, would be, is that tree deciduous? Does it lose its leaves every year? Or is it coniferous? Does it have needles? Does it stay uh, green all year round? You also want to know how high or low on the tree it's growing. If it's growing right at the base of the tree, that could be what's called a butt rot. Um, it rots the buttress of the tree, or it could be growing higher up and that would be potentially a different species. One of the uh, forageables that we'll be learning about this year that you can determine species based off of the height of growth is between um, Latiferous cincinnatus, which is uh, a type of chicken of the woods that has a butt rot, it grows at the base, or Latiferous sulfurous, which grows higher up on the, um, on the tree. Latiferous sulfurous uh, has a yellow pore surface, whereas the cincinnatus 
has a white pore surface. But if you didn't look at the color of the surface, you could just tell by how high that plant, that uh, mushroom is growing. Um, yeah, so that's it for substrate. Um, even after you notice all these things, even if you bring your mushroom back, sometimes it can be really hard to figure out what species you're looking at. Some of you have already ran into this. There's the classic LBMs, the little brown mushrooms, but even larger um, mushrooms that seem kind of distinctive can have thousands of species within the same genus. So if you find yourself a Cortinarius, in that Cortinarius genus, there are literally thousands of species. And um, sometimes it's just really, really difficult to figure out the species. Sometimes you need a microscope. So don't be discouraged if you find a mushroom and you don't exactly know who it is, because not only are there lots of possibilities for who it could be, but there's also a lot of mushrooms that haven't even been named. So even if you do get to a certain point, if you collect mushrooms your whole life, you're likely to find a few mushrooms that probably haven't been named, especially if you're you know, going out in the woods where people haven't really been in a while. Um, it can also help to harvest multiple specimens at different ages. So this can help uh, with, particularly with boletes. They, the size of the cap can sometimes determine what species is. You know, you'll have one mushroom within this range and one mushroom within this range, but the one that's bigger, if it's a young specimen, it could seem like it would be this one species, but it could actually be the other. So if you can possibly get multiple specimens, that can help. Um, and then again, just to reiterate, checking out the base of that stalk can be really important. So where that stalk meets the ground, um, one of the major mushrooms you want to make sure to check for, one of the real reasons why you want to check for that stalk is uh, for amanitas. So amanitas will have what's almost like, it's called a, a, it's just like a little egg sac at the bottom. It almost looks like it's growing out of an eggshell. And if you see that, that can really help you distinguish amanita from other similar looking mushrooms. Some things you'll just, get with practice. So there's a, a large group of mushrooms called Lactarius. They're called Lactarius because they lactate when you break their gills or when you break their flesh, they'll exude a little milky latex. Um, you know, that you want to do when it's fresher as opposed to when it's more dried out, it won't exude that uh, latex as obviously. Um, spore prints, to take a spore print, I'll upload the video that I, I made. Um, but basically you take your cap, remove the stalk, put the cap, gill side down or spore, spore side down. On a surface, I like to use tin foil. You can also use white paper, half white paper, half black paper to help um, make sure that you have a contrasting color under there. Put a bowl over it, something to kind of stop as much wind from getting to it overnight. And then the next day you can check for that spore print on there. You can also do it without the bowl, but then you don't get as defined of a, of a drop of the spores. They can be a little bit wind blown. Keeping a journal can really help with uh, learning, mushroom, learning mushrooms and fungi. Um, if you describe as much as you can about the mushroom before you go to the, the uh, key or some identification help, that can really help you remember, okay, here are all the details I know about this mushroom. Here's where I found it, what it smelled like, all that kind of stuff. Um, to figure out the identification of your fungi, it's really good to have a key. Um, keys are just a series of yes or no questions and they you know, say, you know, is it yellow or is it black? Or, you know, does it milk when you break it or does it not? And you answer these yes or no questions all the way down to uh, as far as you can. Sometimes you go down the wrong path, you realize this is nothing close to what I've got, but, you know, the keys take practice, um, but they're also not perfect sometimes. Um, Mushrooms Demystified has a pretty darn good key for getting you to the mushroom family. It's a little bit more focused towards California, but I you can use it all over the place because it has that family um it covers the family level. Mushroomobserver.org, if you haven't set up an account yet, I highly recommend you do so. Um, there's a lot of people skimming that website all the time that can help you very quickly get a good idea of what you're looking at. And then you can go from what they say to look for similar mushrooms. The smell of some mushrooms can be very distinct. The most common smell is smells like a mushroom, kind of earthy, a little bit fleshy, but some smells can be really distinct. Um, if you find a mushroom that smells like a lobster, it could be lobster mushroom. If you find one that smells like chlorine, that could be, in my experience, is often um, a type of amanita. Um, there's some uh, mushrooms that have a floral smell. There's one called megacalibia, which comes out actually pretty early in the season. It's one of the earlier guild mushrooms. Um, watermelon rind, that's your, uh, a couple others, but also um, pheasant back. Uh, it could smell like shrimp. That's a aborted entoloma. And other, other smells can be very distinctive. Um, the stinkhorns are one that you will definitely remember uh, because they smell very fetid. They smell like 
kind of decay. Their um, their spores are often spread by flies and things that like rotting, so they make the scent of rotting. Um, yeah, that is a rough overview of what you need to know for collecting mushrooms. So far, I haven't seen too many mushrooms coming out. Um, when I was hiking with my friend Max this past weekend, we found uh, auricularia or wood ear. Um, that's a really, really nice mushroom to put in soups. Um, maintains its flesh, maintains its flavor. Um, yeah, but there, you, there will be mushrooms coming out. Morels are coming soon, and they, we will very shortly be seeing a lot of mushrooms. So keep your eyes out for them. If you see them, take pictures, collect them, learn what they are. Uh, again, when you're collecting mushrooms, mushrooms are the reproductive structure of the organism of the fungus. So if you collect your mushroom, you're only helping to spread its spores because most of those spores are landing directly under the mushroom. So if you collect them and you're walking through the woods, you're actually giving that spore, those spores more of a chance to spread elsewhere. So keep sharing your pictures of mushrooms, keep getting out there, and let me know if you have any questions in the forum.